Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our quarterly SIRA uh, webinar series. The topic for today's webinar is the 2017 SIRA survey results. Before we move on to the webinar itself, I wanted to give you a little update about the firm. Um, if you can see the screen in front of you, you might notice a slight difference. Uh, we've been through a facelift. Uh, we got a new logo, uh, we have a new website, uh, and our name has changed. It may look like it's a slight change, but it's, uh, it's huge for us. So uh, we got rid of the N percent. So we are now Wilkin Garden Plan. And uh, please visit our website, have a look at it. It's much more interactive. Um, so it, it's a new look, but it's the same people. So uh, that has not changed. So moving on to our uh, webinar for today. My name is Mohamed Saviani. I will be your moderator for today. Uh, I'm a principal here at the firm. Our two speakers for today are uh, Joe Chorba. Joe Chorba is a principal at the firm. He has been with us for over 16 years. His main focus is community associations for which he does audits, reviews, compilations, consulting reports, and agreed upon procedures reports. Joe is also a CFE and specializes in forensic fraud examinations. Michael Mezzo is a supervisor here uh, and has been with the firm for over six years. He also focuses on audits, reviews, and compilations for community associations. Mike is one of our technical leaders in the CIRA department. So before we start the uh, actual webinar itself, uh, we'll go through some housekeeping rules here. For questions, please feel free to ask questions. Questions can be submitted via the pane in the GoToWebinar screen. And for polling, uh, we will have some polling questions throughout uh, the webinar itself, and they will be announced peri uh, periodically throughout the presentations. Quest the answers can also be given through the GoToWebinar uh, space there. Um, and if by any chance you did miss something, uh, don't worry, our webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded via the link below. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Joe. Oh, wait, actually, before we do that, we will have our first polling question. So uh, before starting, we'd like to know uh, our audience. So tell us about yourself. Are you a homeowner or board member, a property manager, a professional, or somebody else within the field here of the CIRA industry? All right, so we'll give it a few more seconds here, and uh, I think we'll shut the polling now. So what do we have here? So we have, it looks like 75% of us, a few listeners are homeowners, and about 19% are property managers. We have a few others there. That's excellent. I'm hoping that this webinar gives you a lot of information that you can use uh, for your associations. So I'll turn it over to our speakers. Great. Um, so I'm excited to do this again. We, we've been doing this survey for, for quite some time. Um, I think this is our eighth edition of the survey, and it's done every three years. So it covers a, um, a pretty long period of time. So we have um, here at the firm, we, we audit between six and 700 condos and HOAs um, in New York and New Jersey. Um, these uh, the participants of the survey here are primarily New Jersey, and I think we had um, roughly 400 to 425 um, um, of, our, of our condos and HOAs uh, participate in the survey. And what we do is we, we try to compile all of the data that we have available to us um, to see, you know, what it tells us. So is there any, are there any trends? What, what are some of the information that we can get from, from this um, um, wealth of data that we have from, from our clients? Um, so we put together a survey and what we try to do is break it down into different um, categories. So based on size, um, makeup of the association, whether or not they have um, 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 different types of amenities, um, you know, versus maybe a high rise or a co-op, um, HOAs are, are, are another category that we look at. And then, like I said, we look at the financial data across all of the participants participants of the survey um, to see what information uh, we can we can derive from that so over the last couple of go rounds of our of our survey um, 
we decided that, you know, now that we have some history, um, this being the eighth edition, um, we can go back and take a look at some trends based on past surveys. And that's what we're going to do today. So we, we always have a, a printed version that comes out, um, you know, roughly, you know, September or October um, of every third year. Um, and that just looks at the financial data for that particular year that we're surveying. So all the most recent uh, survey covers the financial data for um, 2017. So um, everything that we're looking at is through 2017. What we um, um, what we did with this webinar is we wanted to look at um, trends in history comparing past surveys and see where things were um, then versus where they are today. So keep in mind that this is you have to consider all the makeup of your association when you're trying to compare your association to some of the data that we have here. Um, you know, there are differences, and this is really just to try to find some averages. Um, sometimes your association may or may not um, fit into some of the categories, um, but this is a useful tool, I, I think, to, to try and um, when you're doing your budget or just trying to get a sense of where you fit in um, with the market. and. And also keep in mind that these are these are the associations that we have as clients. Um, so, um, but again, use it. Uh, hopefully, it's a tool. It's one of the things that we try to do with the firm to to add value um, and and provide value to our, our clients. So, yeah. let's see. Okay, so Mike um, Mike has helped helped me go through the survey, and he's he's the one who really dug into a lot of the details this year. Um, so I'm going to let Mike go into some of the, the different trends and some of the, the different things that we found from this year's survey. Yep. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, so that's a great point that Joe talked about, too. I just wanted to reiterate that all the information that we're going to be going through today isn't just current information, which is really helpful for boards. Um, I saw that we have 75%, I think, of uh, board members and unit owners, which is really great. So this information will be all from the period of 2002 through 2017. Um, so that's really helpful because it's not just going to tell you about the last year or two, um, but a lot of associations that I work with might be um, in some financial troubles. Maybe they have large deficit positions and so on and so forth. So this um, information that we put together today can kind of help paint a picture of maybe some of the reasons or, or common trends that kind of got you in that situation that you're in today. Um, and then it also kind of looks towards forward trends. You know, where are we heading? We kind of know how we got to where we are today, um, but where is the, the data over the last more recent years pointing? You know, is it trending upwards and where are we headed? So as we go through, we tried to uh, compile certain information that that was we thought would be most helpful to boards throughout their budgets and financial planning and these are the topics that that we came up with for this year so you can see maintenance assessments uh will be talked about we'll have some charts on delinquencies which is uh you know uh, delinquent unit owners um special assessments expenses and and the breakup of expenses what makes up your annual expenses uh, and also replacement funding so before we get into the actual charts, just a, a few items to note. Um, you know, a lot of the information that we're going to be going through is displayed through charts and graphs. As Joe uh, alluded to before, a lot of the information um, is broken down into buckets. And the reason that we do that is because we want it to be as user friendly and as uh, useful to, to the end user of the study. So for example, we try to break it down into information based on size and type of uh, association. So for example, we might have on those and break that information in a unit of zero to 50 units um, and then do another bucket of 51 to 100 units for example so that really lets the user of the study drill down to a really specific set of information that will hopefully be very relevant and comparable so as we go through those charts just keep that in mind um, they are uh, broken out by buckets we'll explain which buckets are included in each chart on every slide and just some other reminders um, I know Joe also mentioned this as well the information does include averages. We do have a pretty big population that we included in our survey this year. It was a, over 400 different sites, um, but it is still averages. So it's always important. You know, it's not always apples to apples. It's important to look through specific information for your site um, and make sure that you're comparing that back to, to evaluate it and look into any significant differences that you're seeing because there may, may very well be a good reason for them. 
And one of, one other thing as we go forward, um, right before we'll, we'll get into the charts in a second, but I also wanted to, to let you know that, like I said, we're always trying to find um, new innovative ways to, to provide value to our clients. So we'll get into it a little bit later, but we are working on um, ways to um, do this survey a little more frequently. We do this every three years and we find um, after year two, or one, two or three, people start asking when you're gonna do it again, when you're gonna do it again. So we're, uh, so we hear you, and we're gonna we're we're trying to find a way to do this um, more frequent frequently, hopefully um, annually, so we can have um, some more uh, more current information as we get further out past the, the survey. Um, and also, we're working on some um, some other analysis using data from individual um, associations uh, for our clients only. Um, that will um, take a look at your client and how they've been trending, and, and some of the different analysis. Um, um, those are the things we can analyze for, for the individual associations as well. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, um, so as you go through this, kind of keep in mind um, that we're going to be rolling out um, similar to what some of the things you're going to see here for the individual um, clients of ours. So that's kind of kind of exciting, something we're excited and, and looking forward to. Hopefully, hopefully you'll find that useful. So Mohammed will, will go through the next polling question. All right, so we have our next polling question here. Uh, what, do you, what do you see as your site's main goal with respect to the annual maintenance fees? Uh, maintenance fees at an appropriate and affordable level, uh, meaning gradual increases, uh, strive to avoid any increases, keep fees the same, keep the same, and utilize special assessments when needed, rely on third-party funding such as loans to cover any unforeseen funding needs. So please go ahead and, uh, and vote. All right, so a few more seconds here. Um, all right, and we'll go ahead and close the poll here. So it looks like um, about 80% of you uh, maintain fees at an appropriate level and affordable level, and you do uh, gradual increases. Uh, about 13% uh, strive to avoid any increases, and 7% uh, uh, keep the same and do utilize special assessment. So a majority of you do use the uh, increase, slight increase, and uh, as uh, these two gentlemen are going to explain to you, I think that's kind of the way we tend to recommend. That's what we hope to see, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. So we do, and, and I'm gonna start off with, with a, an easy chart here where we took uh, a couple examples of, of maintenance fees over the last 15 years, and it's and it's really what we would expect to see, and I guess it's consistent with um, with the polling question on um, where you have you know a lot of, uh, more associations trying to um, stick towards small increases each year. And you, as you can see, over time, um, uh, maintenance fees have increased uh, for these different categories from 2002 to 2017. So we'll start off with an easy one. It's something that is the results that we expected to see. Obviously, um, cost increase over time. Um, so this is kind of what you, you think a chart would look like as far as maintenance fees. But there's a couple things that uh, Mike is going to go through that we wanted to point out. Um, so even though this is a standard, this is what everybody starts with, right? What are our maintenance fees? How much are they? Uh, what's it going to cost kind of thing. Um, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper and, and kind of take a look at some of these increases and and um, really see if there's uh, what they're telling us and and uh, and what we can use with that information. So um, so this is another chart which um, the last chart, I'll just go back, the last chart just kind of um, shows you in, in graph form um, the maintenance fees each year and, and where, where they end up in 17. Um, this next chart is the same categories, but it just shows the dollar amounts that they and the percentages that they've increased over the same period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, this one is just a little bit easier to read and put those numbers onto the slides. And and like Joe said, we can. This is you know one of the more simple ones, but it's obviously one of the hotter topics that we see. You know, we do a, a ton of uh, meetings, face-to-face -face meetings with boards, uh, and even when we don't have a, a survey year, it's always the biggest topic that people want to know is you know. Why, what makes up my maintenance fee? Why is it going up every year? You know, how does it compare to other sites that are similar to mine? So this is really a hot topic uh, on a recurring basis. And as you can see here, kind of that third column over, um, you know, we, we start with our 2002 uh, fees. We worked over to our 2017 fees and that, that third column shows our total increase 
over the 15 year period that just finished. So um, you can see we, we kind of gave a good um, array of, of buckets here. We started out from small to large. So we have condos one to 50. And then at the bottom, you can see we gradually got a little bit bigger until we had uh, multi-story store condos all the way at the bottom, which sometimes can be over a thousand units depending on the site. So across the board, regardless of what size and type and makeup your uh, association had, it was very consistent that there was increases across the board. You could see over the years, um, those have ranged from the lowest of a 39% increase all the way up to a 57% increase for uh, the multi-story condos, which were the biggest. Um, and just a note, that increase, it, it might seem like a very high number, but it is over a 15 year period. So when you work that out into the um, you know annual increases per year, that really works out to about a two and a half to a 4% increase um, over each year annually over the last 15 years. So, now that we kind of see that those numbers are going up, we're left with the, the question of what does it mean? Why are they going up and where are we headed? So, um, you know, this is I'm, I'm glad that a lot of the, the responses from that polling question came back that you do do gradual increases on an annual basis, because this is really one of the hot topics that we see uh, when we go to meetings. So a very common thing that I see when I go to meetings is that there are certain boards and certain associations uh, that really want to stay on the board and keep power. So, you know, it's kind of a popularity vote sometimes when you're running these elections. And, and the easy thing to do is say, you know what, I'm going to keep all the unit owners happy and, and not have any increases in our maintenance fees this year. Um, and granted, that might keep you on the board, but you're really doing a disservice to the unit owners and to your association uh, when you do that because, you know, your costs are going to go up every single year. And it, it's just, you know, the facts of life. Every year, I'm sure you're going to have increases in your insurance premiums, um, your landscaping, snow, all of your vendors are going to, you know, have price increases because their costs are going to go up and they need to fund that as well. So they're going to pass those increases on to you. Um, so what we really like to see is the concept of pay as you use. We hate when we see situations, you know, when, when there haven't been increases in 10 plus years, say, and now you have an association that's sitting in a really large deficit position and they have no choice but to special assess or get some type of funding. And what happens is that current unit owners wind up, you know, paying those assessments. And some of those unit owners that might have lived there during that 10 year period where there were no increases in assessments, they might not even be living there anymore. So what happens is that you have people footing the bill and paying the, those assessments that really should have been paid by those prior unit owners over time. So we like to see those gradual increases. Um, and, and that is what the chart really indicated that most sites out there are doing um, because it, it's really a pay as you use concept. Another note to talk about um, is just, you know, that increase in cost that, that we referred to just a second ago. So I always like to look back um, at the consumer price index as well. So this is just really your general inflation. It's a, it's a good measure. Um, this index is what's the, the general inflation that I'm seeing in my own products that I'm buying for my household. So um, you can see in the chart from the period of 2003 all the way to 2007, there has not been a period where it was a decrease. Every single year, the consumer price index has been increasing. And over the 15 year period, all of those charts add up to a total increase of 34%, which Joe can kind of uh, go over real quick and show you how that relates to the increases in maintenance fees as well. Yeah, so uh, just to add to um, Mike's comments on raising maintenance fees, the other, the other point um, that I'd like to make is you know, Mike, make the point of, of sometimes, um, you know, if you're not increasing maintenance fees, you have to um, find other ways to, to fund things. Sometimes you end up in a deficit position. Sometimes um, you have to sacrifice uh, your reserve contributions in order to your for your operating fund to, to keep up with uh, the increase in costs. So those are some of the negative things that that um, uh, that can happen from not increasing maintenance fees. Um, but some of the positive things you can you, you get from keeping increases um, um, moving at a, at a steady amount each year are, um, you know, one, you know, we find that um, um, your AR and your, um, allow, or your, your delinquencies are directly affected. So when you have small increases over time, typically your unit owners are, they, 
they're able to handle that a little better. They can budget for it. They expect it. They know it's coming, um, small increases, and they can handle that as part of their, their daily life a little bit better than um, having a year where there's maybe a 10% increase and maybe a little bit more than, than their you know, lifestyle can handle, and we see delinquencies increase. So, But one of the positives um, also is, is just simply maintenance on the association. So a lot of times if you're not increasing maintenance fees, you are maybe cutting services or maybe delaying um, certain uh, things on your wish list, some things that make the property look nice, or uh, maybe there's some landscaping projects that you're, you're putting off because, um, um, because you don't have um, the funds to do them. So it can, you know, it can, you know, some people would argue the other, um, that it doesn't, but it can have an effect on your uh, property values as well because people, um, you know, they, a lot of times just, you know, when you go into the store, you, you buy with your eyes, something looks nice and, and you automatically think that um, um, that it's worth more or that you would pay more for it. So keeping the property main, properly maintained and having the funds to do that um, really is a key component of managing the association's finances and, and keeping the, the, the maintenance fees going mm-hmm. um, year after year. So. And that's a great point, too, that Joe mentioned that a lot of times, you know, you when you don't see increases, it's always going to be a red flag, no matter what. Um, you can you can hide it sometimes in a way to say so you might not always see the uh, immediate impact of not increasing your fees and I just wanted to note you know if you are living in a site that hasn't had any increases it's it's always going to raise a red flag and at the end of the day someone is always going to be left to foot that bill um, to make up all those costs so a lot of times what we see is is boards will um, cut what's not immediately necessary. So Joe was saying there might be some enhancements to just make the place look nicer, or one of the more common ones that we see is that they will cut back on the funding to the replacement fund. Um, So those are things, like I was saying, you might not immediately see the impact of that, but come 15 years down the road when when you have to replace your roofs or another capital component, and all along you were were supposed to be saving all this money for it, and then at the end of the day you look in your reserve account and you say, you know, where's all this money? What happened to it? We should have been putting X, Y, Z away for the last five years, but we haven't been. So um, it's always something that uh, you should look into. If any of your sites that you haven't had increases in a long time, I can guarantee you that your costs have been going up. So it's definitely uh, an item to note and something to bring up to your boards um, if you're seeing that. So the next chart that we're going to kind of dive into deals uh, very closely with maintenance assessments um, and deals with delinquencies. So unit owners who are problematic in paying and may have accumulated large balances uh, due to the association over the years. So this chart was really interesting. So AR typically from our experiences and what we saw in the data is much more of a problem for the larger sites, those mid to larger sites. Um, so that's the kind of information that we included here because that was the most relevant uh, information to those sites. So you could see we didn't include those smaller sites, you know, the, the zero to 100 units. We started out with condos 201 to 500 and went up up to the multi-story condos. And then we also included only the larger HOA, so anything over 100 units. These were really the sites that had significant delinquencies. Um, and as you can see in looking at the charts, regardless of the size, um, all sites had significant increases over the last 15 year period. And what was really interesting is that if you look at the period from 2002 to 2008, things really pretty much, you know, there were slight increases, but they were relatively flat during that period. Um, And as everyone knows, you know, we had the, the market crash in 2008 and the recession hit, and it's really interesting to see how much of an impact that had. There are very large increases from 2008 through the period of 2014, when the effects of the recession were really hitting uh, individuals the hardest. Um, so as you can see now, the, you know, now that the economy has been recovering a little bit, we're starting to see more of an upswing on the economy. From 2014 to 2017, over that the most recent three-year period, we're actually starting to level out now. And in some cases, we're actually seeing decreases where associations are starting to recover um, from those large uh, impacts that they had over the, uh, as a result of the recession. So that's kind of what we did with analyzing the numbers. You can see the the 2000 the time leading up to 2008, you know, was relatively flat. Um, we did see that large spike, and and now we're we're starting to see a recovery, which is great. 
Um, so one of the useful uh, tools that we, we like to look at as well is comparing what your current balance is in receivables, what your delinquencies are in comparison to your annual budgeted income. Um, so as you can see, the green charts in the, the front of that, uh, the green columns rather in the front of that chart are your delinquencies, the average delinquencies. And then in the back row, you're gonna have the average annual income. So as you can see, it does, it's not a huge portion, but it does make up you know, a, a portion um, of your annual income. And if we go to the next slide, we have some numbers that might keep it a little bit uh, easier to see. Um, so all the way in the right column is, is where we're gonna be looking. So for condos, 200 to 500 units, um, our delinquencies uh, represented 12% of our annual maintenance fee income. So that really means if you budget, you know, uh, 100,000 a year as your income, 12% of that uh, is is, um, is sitting in AR, basically right off the bat, you can say. So for condos over 500, that percent goes up to 15. The highest one, which is usually pretty common, is the condos multi-story. And then our HOAs, usually we don't have as, uh, it's not as significant as a problem, and that was a uh, 6%. So Mike, real quick, before we go on, there was one question. I'm just going to go back a couple um, slides to this, because uh, mm -hmm. there was one of our, yeah, our let me read the viewers question just out, wanted please. to know whether or not this, um, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, the question was, are these reserves or actual write-offs? Yeah. Um, so this just to is, clarify. yeah, so this is actually uh, just delinquencies. They're not, um, we're going to get into what's reserved on those allowances, but th these numbers in this chart includes just gross receivables. We will get into allowances and, and actual bad debts and write-offs in a second, but these are gross uh, receivable balances. Okay. Thanks okay. for sending so that in. Can, yeah. Um, and that's actually, so just before we move on to the next slide and get into those allowances that that, um, that uh, listener brought up, usually we like to see somewhere around 10. Um, you know, delinquencies are unfortunately inevitable. It's very rare. You know, like Joe said, I think we do 800 or so. How many do we do? Well, now with the new merger, we're actually uh, getting closer to, I think, eight to 900 associations. Yeah, so 800 to 900 associations. And I think, you know, Mohammed, myself, and Joe can all agree that it, it's very rare that we see a site with no or, you know, very, very minimal delinquencies. Right. Usually there's always at least some level of delinquency. So it's, it's you know, part of running the business. And unfortunately, it, it is what it is. It's, it's inevitable. So... We know that it's going to happen. We strive to, to tell our, our clients that about 10% is acceptable. So you can see that the, those numbers are starting to fall back down. Um, you know, if you go back to that 2008 to 2014, a lot of those percentages were actually up above 20%. So we're starting to see the numbers come down and we're hoping that it continues to do so. That's, that's a great trend. But just one point I want to I wanna make about the delinquencies is, is it really is important to understand the makeup of your, your um, um, your delinquent owner. So, you know, the, you're going to have a different approach if, you're, if your balance is made up of only a few owners with large balances um, that may be in foreclosure or rent receivership or whatever it may be um, versus a, an association that may have a larger number of unit owners that are delinquent but that have um, small balances. So, you know, just like every conversation that we have, it's always, always good to be vigilant and make sure that you're on top of your um, your collections. Um, you know, I, I always I always say that that you know you you know sometimes you feel bad sending collection letters and your your um, um, when you have to stay on top of certain people because maybe they're having a hard time paying or you know they have certain events in their life and you want to work with them. But at the end of the day, I, I think you're you're helping them, doing them a favor, and and not letting them get too far behind because the further they get behind. Uh, the harder it is for them to to um, make that back up. So stay on top of your uh, collections and your collection policy, and and keep those uh, delinquencies uh, as low as possible. Yep, I would say early and often. Right? Yep. <laughs> early and often follow-ups. So this uh, always goes into the um, question that was just brought up before. So. Uh, this is a really useful chart and interesting chart um, because it, it shows the allowance established, the average allowance established in comparison to those gross receivable balances that we talked about. So that um, brighter, more vibrant green on the left of the chart, that represents the gross AR um, for each of those different buckets. And then that darker greenish kind of blue on the right side of it, that represents the allowance that's been established for each of those uh, buckets as well. So as you can see, 
the allowance really makes up a lot of the gross AR. So what we're, we're referring to when we talk about the allowance is that anything that's basically allowed for is something that we don't think is really going to be collectible. So if you, for example, have a, a unit owner, a lot of these delinquencies go, go pretty far back. So if you have a unit owner, for example, that hasn't paid their maintenance fees and, you know, 18 months, for example, there's a very good chance that they're not going to turn around and, and, and pay you tomorrow. So when we have those situations, we don't think that it's collectible. We set up that allowance and take that bad debt expense um, to account for that. So um, as you can see, the, the more common percent is that 15 to 17 percent. So even though we have those big um, assessments receivable, you can see for condos over 500, it's it's um, over 350,000 of gross AR in that chart. However, only 16% of that is something that we think is going to be collectible. So that's a pr pretty significant number, and it's something to definitely consider that even though you have these big, large delinquencies, and even though you might be doing follow-ups like Joe mentioned and getting your attorney involved, you know, there's a good chance that you still might not get any of it. You might only get a portion of it. So it's just something to consider um, and make sure that you're incorporating that into your, your budget for bad debt each year. And just one last thing on this. This is... Um this is probably because of the the other charts that we looked at with the spike in in, in um, AR <clears throat> and uh, the ability for people to pay those maintenance fees, property prices, all of all of that um, goes into uh, such a low percentage of the outstanding balance being deemed collectible. You know, we expect the next time we do this for those numbers to increase actually because mm -hmm. it doesn't happen overnight. Some things take a little time to kind of work themselves out. We expect as the you know the economy is improving, improving the home values are going up, um, you know, maintenance fee um, uh, delinquencies are going down. Um, when we get to the end of the year, I, in the next few years, I would expect these allowance numbers to also go down and have a larger percentage of your your um, maintenance fees uh, being collectible. So mm -hmm. that's just something to look, look keep keep an eye on. Um, um, as we get into the next couple of years. Yeah. And just um, one last note on this one before we uh, head on to our next topic, um, because this is usually one that really faces a lot of associations. So you might be asking yourself, you know, okay, I do find myself in a situation where I do have really high delinquencies and I know right off the bat that I'm going to have, you know, 15 unit owners that aren't going to pay their maintenance fees this year because they've been, you know, historically delinquent. So the question is, how do I combat that? How, how do I account for that? And how do I take care of that? So um, when you go through your, your annual budgets, this gets accounted for through that bad debt expense line item in your budget. So this is really important that a lot, a lot of times this gets looked over and just gets carried forward as last year's amount in your budget, and it doesn't really get revisited. It just gets carried forward. However, you know, if you have 15 unit owners that you know are not going to be paying their maintenance fees, you're really starting off in the hole. Your budget um, assumes 100% payment from all unit owners. You know, you are budgeting, you know exactly your cost, you're budgeting to break even. You know, your costs dictate exactly what the, the maintenance fee is going to be. So when you have 15 unit owners that aren't going to pay, you know that you're going to be, you know, running in a deficit uh, that year right off the bat because of those 15 unit owners, you're not going to have enough funds to cover your costs. Um, so that's why that bad debt expense line item is really important. You want to really look at your AR listing on an annual basis, look at the payment history of all those people included on that, on that report and determine who you think is going to pay and who you think is not going to pay. For anyone that you don't think is going to be paying their maintenance fees this year, it's really key to be including their annual maintenance fee within that bed debt expense line item. Um, and, and unfortunately, it is the other unit owners that are going to be left to foot the bill for that. But that's why we like to get, you know, as early as often on the follow ups and get the attorneys involved if we need to, to try to get these people to pay. Yeah, that's a really good point. And uh, one thing you should remember also are those legal fees that you're incurring mm -hmm. to try and get these people to pay. Um, usually you build them back, but if they're not paying their maintenance fees, then they're not paying the legal fees either. So mm -hmm. you need to account for that. So I think we're uh, moving on to our, uh, our next, poll our next yep. uh, polling question, which is actually going to be switching our topic now a little bit. So um, has your site approved any special assessments in the past three year period? All right, we'll give it a few more seconds here. 
and uh, all right we'll uh, shut the polling here so let's see what the results are so the results are uh, 36 percent said yes and 64% said no. Um, I think that's a good thing, actually. Yeah, that's that is a good uh, thing. Because <laughs> as far as I, the way I look at it is that the fewer special assessments you have, uh, the more uh, the budget is, is adequate. And exactly. you're, you're able yep. to cover uh, any things that are coming up. Exactly. Right? Yep. So that's a, that's a great point Mohammed said. If you're doing a really good job of updating your budget on an annual year, you know, you can really do uh, uh, take a step in the right direction of avoiding any of those unforeseen assessments. Of course, there's things like snow that can't be avoided, and, and they, these things always come up. But um, you know, the budget really is a useful tool to help prevent any of those. So, going into our um, special assessment chart, this includes all 400 plus sites that were uh, included in the survey this year. So, out of all of those sites, this is the number of associations over the last 15 years that had a special assessment. Um, so as you can see, it, this chart, uh, when I was going through the data, I, I pulled it in because I just thought it was so interesting how closely this chart was related to that AR and uh, allowance that we just talked about. So as you remember, we saw a really large spike in delinquencies from unit owners, you know, people who were struggling to pay their maintenance fees and might have fell behind. We saw a really big jump between 2008 and 2014 in that chart that we looked at. Now, if we come over to this chart, we can also see that in 2008 to 2014, there was a really large increase in the number of associations that passed special assessments. So um, this goes hand in hand. You know, during that recession, during those really tough financial times, a lot of people were, like Joe mentioned before, just not, you know, they had to cut back on their lifestyle. They, they may have not been able to afford their maintenance fees and some people just fell behind. However, the operations of the association still went on. You know, they still had to complete capital projects. If they had a roof project that needed to re be replaced, they had to do it. Um, and a lot of times they needed the funding to cover that if they weren't getting it from all of the unit owners through their regular budget. So we did see a lot of special assessments through that period. We saw a lot related to regular things like uh, bad snow years, capital projects, where maybe their, their collections weren't as high as they had hoped for and they had to assess. Um, and then we also saw um, special assessments uh, that were really responsive. So they were more, after these situations had happened, they found themselves in, in really poor deficit positions. Um, and in order to get themselves out of those deficit positions, they had no choice but to pass a special assessment to help recover those deficits. So um, similar once again to AR, after we get past that 2014 year, we're really starting to see things recover. Um, and, and the poll that we kind of just did kind of alluded to that. I think 60 something percent uh, we indicated had no special assessments in the last five years, which is great. And our chart here is really relaying that same information. From 2014 to 17, we're seeing a nice dip in recovery and, and that um, we're, we're not seeing as many of those assessments. So looking through those numbers, um, we kind of talked about how the trends in those special assessments are really mirroring the trends that we saw in the receivables. Um, we did have those large spikes from 20, 2008 through 2014, and now we're hoping to see that as a continued recovery from 2004 to 2017. So, you know, three years down the road, if, if or whenever it is that we're doing this next survey webinar and analyzing this data, you know, I, I would like and hope to see that th these trends are continuing to recover and not going back up, uh, barring any other, um, you know, unforeseen issues or economic factors. Um, so dealing with those factors, I just want to talk about that spike from 2008 to 2014. Um, you know, it, it could have been related to a lot of things. We touched on winter storms. They're very common. And also those big capital projects. A lot of times they're even tied to storms. We see ice damming projects. Um, we see roof replacements that might have gotten damaged from winter storms. Um, all those large capital projects that come up, um, if you're not having unit owners pay what you expect and, and your bad debt expense in your budget isn't um, adequate or, or um, in line with your actual collection issues, you're going to find yourself in a, in a shortage on your cash side. So um, a lot of times we talked about before, too, the easiest place to cut your funding when, when things are tight is in the reserves. You know, it's easier to, to cut from the reserves, which you might have to pay 15 years down the road for that project 
when you have your landscapers bill in your hand right now that needs to be paid today. It's much easier to put that money towards the more current uh, issues that are that are facing you today and the, the current financial needs that are right in front of you. Um, and it's easier to put off and, and take money away from, from the savings from, from those bigger projects down the road. So that's a lot of what we saw through that period of 2008 to 2014. And a lot of it was directly tied to the recession. All right, so I think we're moving into our next polling question. Just before I do that, somebody else did ask a question about um, setting up reserve for bad debts. And yes, if you do have delinquents, and as Mike said, you have uh, units that are delinquent and they're not paying, um, you do need to set up a reserve for that bad debt through the budget process. As Mike said, do the calculation based on the maintenance fees times the number of units times 12, plus a little amount of the legal fees to mm -hmm. come up with what that reserve should be going forward. The reserve should be, your, your audit will have a reserve for prior years, but you sh you sh if they're not paying, then you continue to increase that reserve for those people through the budget process. So now we're moving on to our polling question. If you had a special assessment, in the past five years, what did it relate to? Uh, snow or storm damage, uh, deficit recovery, large capital projects, all or some of the above? All right, again, we'll give it a few more seconds here. Um, and I think we're going to shut that poll. So uh, it's interesting here that 42% said it was for the snow or the storm damage. 0% said it was for deficit recovery. 42% again said for large capital projects. And 17% uh, said all or some of the above. So you kind of have a, a mix of different things, I guess, here. So. That's interesting that there's no uh, special well, assessments. For it, is, I, it is interesting in the deficit recovery, but um, a lot of times I look at the large capital projects and, and deficit recovery um, as as being connected in some Possible. ways because yep. um, you know deficit recovery. It's, if you don't have enough to do the large capital projects, it could be for a number of different reasons. But um, but having to to get a loan out just means you simply didn't have enough to do the project. And um, the way a lot of these um, um, associations are and and what we recommend is putting away um, adequate adequate reserves now you know even even the best laid plans uh, <laughs> can right. sometimes um, um, go awry and you, you know and you don't have enough but um, it is interesting that there was no deficit recovery that's actually good to see um, but I look at large capital projects in some ways uh, connected with right with not um, with not funding either your operating or, or your reserves but and anyway, that's um, you know, kind of what we expected, right? yeah. Uh, um, yeah. snow and storm and yeah. other projects. And hopefully we don't have to talk about snow next time. <laughs> yeah, right. Hopefully we'll have a few easy years. It's been rough the last few. So our next topic deals with replacement funding. So a lot of the charts and information that we talked about did discuss the past. You know, we talked about the recession. We talked about how uh, delinquencies have gone up, special assessments were needed to kind of cover those shortages during that period. Um, but I kind of also wanted to look a little bit more future, towards the future and where trends are headed, which is why I put this uh, slide in. So this slide represents the total, uh, the percentage of total replacement costs funded. So if you look at your um, engineering report that they had put together, we're basically looking at of the total cost, you know, if everything were to be needed to be replaced today immediately, if that total cost was say $3 million, just making up a number, what percentage uh, do you have put away today of that total cost? Um, so as you can see, uh, it, it, there are some sites that do have some dips and increases, but in general, there was a, you know, a, a decrease through the period of 2002 up to about, you know, 2008, 2010. And outside of that, we're really seeing um, that it's kind of flatlined. It, it really hasn't moved too much. Um, and once again, just to talk about what sites and what buckets we're talking about here, this ranges um, a, a good mix. We have condos all the way from one to 50, up to multi-story condos, which are included in here. And then we also put in the um, larger HOAs as well. So HOAs over 100. So looking at this information, you know, we kind of wanted to see, okay, this is what happened over the last 15 years. But in relation to the other things we looked at, you know, where are we headed? So we kind of can see funding numbers were probably heavily impacted near the recession. We saw some dips. 
Um, and however, we're, we're not seeing any change now post recession, really. We're seeing that the numbers have really flatlined and, and really haven't had any significant dips or increases. So in looking ahead, you know, looking back to the other things we looked at, we're starting to see that the economy is recovering a little bit. You know, we're starting to see that the need for special assessments isn't as significant. We're seeing a fall off there. Um, we're also seeing that um, maintenance fees are continuing to increase and our delinquencies are going down. So, you know, associations should be seeing an uptick in their cash flows based on those decreased delinquencies. Um, and what we'd like to see over the next, you know, three year period is that the numbers that we talked about with the replacement funding start to swing more upward. So once you have those, um, you know, excess funds coming in, it's important when you do your annual budget to, to account for that and not just keep the, you know, a lot of your replacement funding might have gotten cut during that period and you might have been doing only a portion of what the engineer recommended, for example. It's important not to just carry forward that annual funding requirement um, based on last year's, but look to the study, see what the engineer recommends. If you're not funding what they recommend, you know, maybe bump it up if you have that extra cash and put away some more money into the reserves. Um, or if you're already funding, um, try to take a look at what uh, funding method you're following. Usually they include different levels of funding. Um, and maybe you can have the extra cash to, to increase to a higher level of funding and put away a larger amount of your reserves. So keeping in that theme, we kind of wanted to see how you measure up. So this information um, is actually not historical. This is just based on um, 2017 year end. So at the end of 2017, um, these were the um, average percent funded of your total replacement costs for all of the buckets that we included in the survey. So Mike, I, this is a good indication, and, I, and this is one of the examples where I, I think um, it's good to have this information because again, it, it, you can take a look at what you're doing in your association and see how you stack up versus the, you know, the population or at least um, uh, the survey results. But just keep in mind, you know, one of the, one of the most common questions that that we get at at, um, at board meetings is, do we have enough in reserves? Are we adequately funded? So this is one of the, the charts when we look at it. This is the percent fund funding that you have um, based on your study or, or in the participant study. Um, but it's important for you to kind of dig a little deeper when you're, when you're looking at your own association to say, okay, you, you shouldn't just say, okay, um, you know, I, I'm in the 126 to 200 category. It says that the, the average is 20%. I'm at 22%. I'm good you really should just go and take it a step further and take a look at this, um, your study and see what the projected balance is um, on the, the cash flow analysis to see what balance they project you to be at or how, what percent funded they, they expect you to be at at, at the end of that particular year. Um, you could be um, at different points in your cycle. I mean, you could, have, um, you could have a large project coming up in the next year or two um, causing that percentage of your total funded balance to be higher, maybe higher than, than the average um, because you're putting money away in preparation of that large project. Or uh, vice versa, you may have just completed a project which depleted your, your, your reserves, um, which may make your balance lower than average. Uh, so it's good, this is good, a good benchmark to see what um, the industry averages are. Um, but it's also important when you're trying to figure out whether or not you're adequately funded to take it a step further um, and look at the study and see what expenses um, that they're projecting, uh, what expenses you just uh, finished in the last few years, and also what the, um, um, the study is projecting your balance to be at the end of the current year. Mm -hmm. um, so again, use this as a benchmark, um, but you, you, it's good to just kind of dig a little bit deeper um, to really find out how you stack up and measure up. Um, mm -hmm. That's a great point, yep. And uh, just to throw one point on top of what Joe just said, that study really is uh, a great tool. And the most important thing is making sure that it's just up to date. So a lot of times we see boards funding um, and they might say, oh, well, I'm in line with this, with what the study says. And then we take a look and the study is you know, 12 years old. So um, that at a point, at a certain point, that study will become, you know, 
no longer a useful budgeting tool for the association once it gets to that age. The, the costs have probably increased significantly. So much has probably gone on in, the, in that time that it really the numbers need to be updated. So um, really be going out, getting that done every three to five years is what we usually recommend. I know people are probably, anybody that we've come out to a board meeting, they're probably sick of hearing us say that, but um, it really is a, a really key piece of advice to, to making sure that um, you're putting enough away for those projects when they come up. So moving on, this is our actually last section. So we're going to be talking about um, expenses and what was the makeup of expenses um, for, for different size condominium associations. So the chart that we're talking about here is uh, condos uh, on the smaller end, one to 50 units. And we just wanted to, you know, kind of show you where, where are you spending your money? You know, you're taking in your maintenance fees. What does it go to? That's a, a big question. Uh, that we get a lot of times at board meetings as unit owners, not even board members, will will want to know, we're paying so much, we don't see it all the time, where does it go? So there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes and unit owners don't always see, and we thought we'd put these charts in to kind of help break out where your money is going and where you're spending it. So a common theme as we go through these slides is that you'll see building and grounds maintenance and administrative uh, really make up the largest percentage of, of all of the uh, expenses that we'll be going through. So for condos one to 50, it was 79% of your total expenses consisted of administrative uh, and buildings and grounds maintenance. Um, outside of that, we didn't really see much recreation here because sites one to 50 units usually don't have uh, large clubhouses or amenities like that. It's, they're usually smaller sites. Um, and outside of that, it was really just payroll and utilities, nothing too significant. So moving on and keeping with that theme, you can see here in, in the mid-range condos, 126 to 200, once again, the two biggest pieces of the pie are building and grounds maintenance and administrative. Now, as you can see, the building and grounds maintenance really took up a bigger portion just because of the size of the association. They're much bigger. There's a lot more ground to landscape. There's a lot more roads to clear the snow. Um, that being said, when you add them both up, administrative and grounds and maintenance, you uh, come to 80%. So our last one was 79 I'm sorry, I added it up wrong, 82%. So last one was 79 and now we're at 82%. You can see we do have a little bit of recreation here. That might be things like tot lots if you have them or swimming pools or clubhouses, tennis courts, those type of things. And then once again, payroll and utilities, uh, we're, we're pretty consistent with uh, the smaller site that we just talked about. And then moving on to our largest, so this is gonna be condos over 500. Um, once again, no, no surprise, building and grounds maintenance and administrative were uh, the two biggest. They did 79%. They accounted for 79% of the total expense, which is exactly what it was for units one to 50 and in line with the 82% the that we just saw on uh, the mid-range condos. Um, you can see, once again, outside of that, pretty consistent. The only other thing that we see is a large increase here is the payroll. So a lot of these larger sites have an on-site super. Um, they sometimes have doormen, um, things like that. Um, that's something we don't see as common in, in the smaller sites, but it definitely is more prevalent in those larger 500 plus uh, unit sites. So um, just a note before I, uh, that, that was our last slide of uh, charts and information today, but I just wanted to pass it over to Mohammed to kind of dive into another little surprise that we have with respect to the charts we just talked about. Right, well, so. I'm uh, sorry to interrupt Mohammed, but before we get to that, we have one more question from, from the audience. Um, there was, um, um, somebody was asking um, um, what percentage of, typically what percentage of their maintenance fees um, go towards the reserve funds. So we have some charts here analyzing how the um, operating expenses break down, but um, they wanted to know um, what the right percentage of of, uh, of their maintenance fees should be going to reserves. And I guess the way I, I would answer that is, um, um, is there really is no magic number as far as percentage of uh, of of um, of your maintenance fees. It's really more fact specific to your association. You really need to take a look at, um, um, like we said, going back to the study and making sure that. Um, you look at the study, look at your cash flow projections, and making sure that you're, you're putting away based on the um, projected um, expenses or projected needs of the association. And that could vary in percentage of your maintenance fees um, in the short term and the long term. Um, so as far as percentage, there's real no, no ma magic number as putting a, um, an industry average on a percentage, but um, um, it's important to know what your specific needs are over the uh, short and long term to come up with the amount that should be in the budget. 
Right, uh, but you do remember that FEMA has a 10% requirement, right, for yep. for uh, to be able to be eligible for FEMA loans, mm -hmm. right? Right, yep. right. So yeah, so if you uh, if you have 10%, if you if you don't have a new study, then if you have 10%, then I think you're still okay as far as um, those loans are concerned. There was a um, another question that came out um, is that professional fees uh, as part of these uh, as expense allocations, those are included in the administrative expenses. So uh, they don't, we don't have them as a separate uh, amount. Um, and then, um, the, but they are included in administrative. Uh, somebody else has a uh, another, uh, I guess a comment, um, uh, because a person saying, um, he sees uh, electrical going down uh, because of uh, LED lights and uh, but notices water and sewer are so, uh, soaring because so these are trends in utilities. Mm -hmm. um, so they want to maybe next time we can talk about percentages breakdowns of within the utilities. That's a good point. We'll we'll make a note of that. Um, like like some of the other um, trends, sometimes it takes time for these mm -hmm. things to take effect and really see the industry averages move in certain ways. But um, I think you're right. Now we are seeing some more um, conversions to to more energy efficient. Mm -hmm. Um, utility options, so um, that's something that we'll make a note of, and maybe we'll 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 take a closer look at that next time we do the survey to see if um see if we see any real any impact, yeah. real progress in yeah. uh, as far as energy consumption. Yeah, right, right. So uh, as to the surprise that Mike was alluding to, these uh, charts that you saw uh, going forward in 2019 uh, for for all our clients, what we are going to be doing is with the audited financial statements, we will also be including uh, certain charts for particular to your association. So you'll be able to see uh, your association, uh, things like this uh, expense allocation in a chart form. So it makes it a lot easier to analyze and to see uh, how you're spending the money. But besides that, we will actually have uh, some other uh, charts and some some other information in a visual uh, format and so we are really excited about that we're about to roll that out in 2019 so for all of our clients uh, for your 2018 year ends um, and going forward into 2019 uh, December 31st 2018 and going into 2019 you'll see some other information that we'll provide you hopefully this can help you uh, help the board uh, health management in being able to make sure that you're uh, more uh, fiscally uh, responsible for your association uh, and uh, uh, it helps you to be able to analyze the information and utilize this going forward in your uh, future budgets and your future allocations of reserves and things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, I think uh, we are uh, going to end our webinar at this yep. time. Uh, uh, if you have any questions afterwards, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, reach out to us and uh, send us a question. You have our email addresses on the screen right now. And also, uh, please um, let us know uh, what you think of this survey uh, and of, uh, of this webinar. Give us your feedback. And also, um, if you have any topics that you feel we should cover in the future, please feel free to reach out to us. And as I said right in the beginning, um, this webinar will be on our website within a few days uh, for you to see again or to have any of your other uh, associates or uh, board members uh, to view and listen into. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, happy holidays to all of you and your families from all of us here. Take care. Bye-bye.